let's continue on with a few uh, thoughts that I didn't tidy up in the first half, okay? So thanks to Daniel, he pointed out the fact that I didn't uh, explain about the Eskimos and the stars changing, <coughs> moving. Now, I know for a fact that they've changed, they've moved. I know that because I can see it. I can see the sun is actually shifted more, setting more towards, um, towards the, uh, the south. It's migrated. Whether that means, yeah, to the south, what I mean is this, okay? From my house, I see the sunset. And in the southern hemisphere, this is the summer sun. This, this, this is the, uh, when, when December comes along, <coughs> that day there, in the northern hemisphere, it happens over there. All right, this is the north, this is the south, and this is the middle, east and west here in the middle. So there's 47 degrees, whoops, 47 degrees from here to here, from solstice to solstice, because 23 and a half degrees there, 23, you add those together, you get 47 degrees. So I watch from my house in Narry Warren, I'm sort of at the end of the Dandenong Ranges, so I'm pretty elevated. I've got a deck and I watch the sun. There's, there's a house next door that blocks all of that, all of the winter, autumn, winter stuff, but I see the sun <coughs> doing that. It's beautiful. And it just goes, there's West, Westgate shopping centres around about here, it just about touches Westgate and then, and then goes back. And then it, for six months I can't see it setting in the winter. And of course, in our southern hemisphere, the sun sets forward slash. In the northern hemisphere, it sets that way, right? I found this out when I went to Los Angeles in 2001, and I'm on uh, Santa Monica uh, Beach there, and I'm looking at the sun setting, and I'm going, whoo. <laughs> and, and of course, I prided myself in knowing astronomy and knowing the stars, you know, I can tell you where Orion is and everything like that, and there I'm, whoops. Aha, uh -huh, of course, I'm in the northern hemisphere, the sun's going to be setting like that, not like this. All right? <laughs> because we're in the south. So we, we see the sun from, from the south, right? We're from here, setting that way. But in the northern hemisphere, it sets the other way. So anyway, um, I know that it's moved. I, I'm, I, yet, I, I don't know how much it's moved yet because I've got to wait till the 21st of December comes to see. I've got a marker. My son's school, uh, Baringa State School, there's a, there's a roof and the sun goes to the edge of the roof and then it goes back. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna mark it, but I know already it's, it's advanced. It's out. Are you talking about a pole shift? I don't know whether it's a pole shift or a plane shift because our solar system has a plane, right? There's the sun and our earth is about seven and a half degrees, on, you know, like off the plane. It doesn't, right? So I don't know whether it's this. Someone said that it was a plane, the shift of the plane has done it. But, but I know for a fact, right, by reading guys like Walter Russell, another guy you want to read is Keshava Bahat, the Indian guy who died about 20 years ago. And he was the one that's teaching that our solar system is in a vortex. There's the sun at the apex. This guy agrees. And then the planets conically orbit like this. There's Mercury, Venus, the Earth, conically. So one part of the orbit will be fast, one will be slow. In fact, this is the slow part. <coughs> this is the fast part. That's why Marcus Manilius says the bull and the twins and the crab rise upside down because, it's, because this part is slower and this part is fast, 187 days, 178 days. There's a book that really explains that well. It's called The Round Art by A.T. Man. The which? The Round Art by A.T. Man. Right. Yeah. And that Good. explains that really well. Yeah, so they, it, it's conical and, and they're elliptical. Have to be. If they're in a cone, it's elliptical. So does that answer your question about the, uh, the stars and the Eskimos? Because the Eskimos were saying, clearly they're saying, the, the stars have moved. The heavens have moved and you hear them one by one from different tribes in their native tongue. You can't understand it but for the subtitles. And uh, they're explaining that they, are, they have watched the stars all their lives and they've moved. Yeah, I've seen that too. And it's hard to believe. Yeah, well, there's... How can that happen just all of a sudden? Well, because, as I said, as I said it takes 2,160,000 years 
for the, part, the axis to migrate 360 degrees. All planets do it. Uranus at the moment is sitting on about 87 degrees. That's where we get our ice ages from. Of course. We get our ice ages. Every part of the Earth has been in an ice age. When they discovered the mammoths in Siberia, they said, hey, this was a tropical lush forest. And we've got maps of the Sahara where Egypt was full of palm trees and tropical vegetation. The whole Earth, as it goes around every two million years and brings back a wave of human consciousness, the return of the Christ, we've been doing this for millions of years. This guy says for millions of years we've been on this earth doing that. And, and, and when the ice age comes, it, kill, it kills off man. And then man comes back. And there's waves of this. The, the pyramids, I mean, there's uh, guys like Robert Schock and uh, John Anthony West and Schwala de Lubitsch and um, Gerald Massey and all these great scholars that have exposed... Well, in modern times, you've got Graham Hancock and Robert Bouval and these types. They're exposing that, that the Sphinx is at least 12,000 years old. At least 12,000 years old. You go to university and get educated and they'll tell you that it's all, it's all fits in the model. But, but, but to say that the stars have shifted, that, that's a big thing. Well, they absolutely have. Come out in any yeah. other. Well, this is it. Denial, 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 denial. There's no disclosure with the corporate governments. It's just that river in Egypt, you know? Yeah. Isn't there a lot of amateur astronomers out there? Well, there's a lot of guys with their handheld cameras that are going, um, <coughs> I'm focused on the sun setting, and it's setting over here, and it was setting over there last year. What's going on? Uh, there's tens of these on YouTube. I don't look at them anymore because it's a fact. That happened in our autumn earlier this year. The sun was about, um, I live in Thornbury, and when I'm looking east when the sun's rising, the sun usually comes up around about um, directly across from me. Um, but this time, <coughs> I'm more in Northcote, which was a little bit more south um, the next morning. But then the next day, it was back to its normal position. So I don't know what was going Actually, on there. Yeah. People are filming objects too, circling the moon and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the sun. Yeah. And, the sun. yeah. and they're there. They're there. Elenin and all these Honda and Levy, they're there. Yeah. We may not see them. You don't normally see the comets. There's hundreds of comets, you know, coming in and, and the sun just consumes them. They crash into you see those visions of the comets landing into the sun and the sun just absorbs it. Because, as Wallace Thornhill explains, that the sun is being energised from without, not from within. It's not a hydrogen super bomb that crushes hydrogen atoms at its core and then helium comes from that and, 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 and then it's going to burn out one day. It's, it's gathering all its electrical force from the currents out there called Birkeland currents. Which right? You get sunspots too. Yes. Yeah. There's no actually nuclear fission happening in the sun. No. Yeah. There's none. There. There's none. But these models continue to be spewed out of our universities to keep us stupid. So we can't think for ourselves and have direct knowledge. Because once you know the solar system works, it's all over. That is the system of the solar system. And what happens is the planets, as our Earth was where Mercury was once, and it was as small as Mercury. Now it's bigger because it's out here, because the orbits slow down and the rotation speeds up. So that, you know, there's not an imbalance. Because if, 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 if it didn't speed up in its rotation but slowed down in its orbit, pew, yeah. it just flies off, all right? And then it becomes a sun when it, when it goes away from its primary. See, as Walter Russell explains, the sun is emitting its planets from its rings, from the equator. The planets come from that. They shoot off. And our sun has come from Sirius. It's binary. It's mother, Isis. Sirius is the mother of our sun, Jesus. That's why in Egypt, Egypt they have Isis nursing si Jesus. It's our star system. They knew about it. Everything there is science. And when you realise that, that that spin of the Earth is um, anti-clockwise spin of the Earth is increasing in its spin, you understand where the earthquakes and tsunamis and what have you are coming from. They'll always be there. See, because if our Earth was like that, and now it's like that, well, that curvature there is a lot more uh, concave than this curvature here, isn't it? So if the Earth is expanding, that means the crust of the earth must be straightening. That would account for Japan and Christchurch and all of that. It's just the crust straightening up. 
because it, it's expanding. It's Mother, Mother Earth's just doing what she does. But see, what they do is they see the effect and they say, oh, the earthquakes are causing the tilt. So people get, get scared because they think it's unnatural for the tilt to be straightening up. It should stay at 23 and a half degrees forever, shouldn't it? That's what we're being told. And they know, they know the truth. Mark my word, they know the truth, man. They know it. They're just keeping lies out there, spewing it, until their, their corporations cease to exist by the economy crashing. Once that Rothschild Federal Reserve money runs out, you'll see how everything runs out. Wars, bloodshed, corporations, and all of the bullshit will... We need to pray <laughs> and wish and hope that the economy crashes, really. Sorry. Um, what about this whole Elenin story about each alignment and what it does? Does that have any effect? Or is Elenin something that we, we should look at there while not looking where we should be? Well, I reckon it's been, it's been proven that we've had earthquakes and, and stuff with alignments of Elenin coming in. I reckon it has. But look, when you understand that we are co-creators and we know that we've had destructions in the past because Herodotus wrote about it, the Egyptians, Barossus, Manetho, and all these guys, they wrote about it. We know that. It doesn't mean we're going to have to repeat that in the future. We are co-creators. We are much more conscious than we've ever been. And uh, we have a part in softening the blows that are coming. I believe that, but belief is not direct knowing. Okay? Direct knowing is let's wait and see what happens. But in the meantime, well, what a way to go if a tsunami comes and wipes us off. It's better than dying of cancer or dying of depression or dying of going to war fighting for George Bush or whatever other way you die on this planet. If the solar system says, man, I'm going to give you a show, man, in 2012 and I'm going to bring in a comet and I'm going to do this and that, I'm all for it, man. I'm happy to shed this flesh and go back to cause because the soul and the spirit is immortal. The body is mortal. It's only a vehicle. I mean, I came in my Mitsubishi to, to this place. I'm not attached to it. It just got me here. And this vehicle is just getting us to some place we're going to be from A. And it doesn't matter what, what is coming. There's no need to be fearful anyway. What, what, you know, we've had a good life. We've lived and we know who we are. And so let's, I mean, imagine if a baby in the womb of its mother started panicking and saying, oh, God damn, I don't want to get out of this water of my mum's womb. I'm so comfortable. I'll have to start thinking and getting a job out there. And I don't know what the third dimension's like. I don't know what it's like to breathe air. I'm staying in here. I'm scared, you know. You just, we're being born. We're being reborn. And uh, as Gamaliel said to Jesus, unless one is born again, one cannot enter into the kingdom of the heavens the stars, whence we came. Cancer, Saturn, it's all there. The story's all there. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention, which I forgot to, was, is a real choice little bit. Remember I said the wolf is here, lupus, and over here you have Perseus. Well, guess where the hunter is? The hunter who saves Little Red Riding Hood. Well, Orion, here. <laughs> There's the hunter. He's known as the hunter because he's killing the bull, right? And then when you understand the Kabbalistic man, Adam Cadmon, and you know that the head is here, you start to ask yourself, ah, wow. Uh -huh. So you've got Orion killing the bull. That would be the left brain killing the right brain. And in fact, that's what Manly P. Hall says in one of his books that I haven't brought along, but quoting the, the uh, occultists and the spiritual wise masters who know the meaning of all things because they know this, says that's what it means, Cain killing Abel. This guy wants to be the boss. He's a boy. He's electric, he's powerful, and he's got brute force. This one's got compassion, and this one has got intuition, the sixth sense. This is five sense stuff. Ooh, I believe it when I see it. I want to see that effect. Don't give me any cause. Right? That's what this brain does. And it goes out and fights war with this hand, which is controlled by the left brain. You know? Marshall. It's all patriarchal. Whenever you see an organisation that has a CEO at the top of it, run for your life. <laughs> because it has been hijacked and overtaken by Rothschild money, man. Because they're behind the whole lot of it. The whole lot of it. Now, let's just go back to law, because that's what you asked, and I was going to... Um, 
because this is very, very powerful. Um, Franco Collins, who I told, who I uh, um, keep referring to, but I'd, I'd like to plug Dean Clifford because his remedies are far more simple. I love Franco Collins, but my God, it's complicated and I'm probably sending you down the wrong path. But I don't want to say that because if you're good with studying and you really want to work stuff out, go to Franco Collins, man, because he has done a lot of research. And most of the stuff I'm getting comes from him, especially this. Pig pens and pills. That's how the system works, guys. All right? I hope I don't m misspell here. That's a D <laughs> when I'm uh, in a hurry. Uh, privileged. I keep saying when I see my presentations, next time I'm going to write better. I'm going to take more time to write. But I realise why I write so fast because it's just so much information. Anyway, privileged international, international government prison estate national system private international ledge ledge e yeah. legislative law that's the system that the elites are running, man. We are in prison. It's a prison estate nation system. And they give us pills. Oh, yeah, lots of them. But the privileged international government, you've got all types here. You've got, you know, rich, the, uh, the uh, industrialists, the elite families and the monarchies and all these people. They, that's, their, that's their mob. And this is what they administer. They administer this. Now check out Franco Collins, Franco Collins's last audio files on uh, talkshoe.com. You can get to it via my Universal Truth School website. And if you get lost, just contact me. But check out his latest audio files. They are so powerful. His last four or five are better than all the other 20 that are on there. And I've done them all. I've, read, I've, read, I've gone over them over, over and over and over. Now I'm on to Dean Clifford and I'll tell you what, that guy is on the money. Once you study his stuff, ain't no turning back. You know who you are. See your passport. P-type. P. Pauper. We are paupers. That's their assumption. That's their presumption in this system where they tell us to register our birth certificates in a ward because we're wards of the state. Um, it says here, the Governor General of the Commonwealth of Australia, being the representative in Australia of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, requests all those whom it may concern to allow the bearer to pass freely without let or hindrance and to afford him or her every assistance and protection of which he or she may stand in need. Why would you need that anyway if you're free, right? You get a license, they give you a license to drive. Well, that's commercial. But who said we're not allowed to travel? I mean, I want to go from A to B, I'll go to A to B. Whether I have to get in a car or a tractor or an aeroplane, I'll find a way, but I don't need a license to do that. Travelling is your right. That's what the passport asserts. But that's what they do when they, they, they pull you over and they say, yeah, can I see your licence, please? What do you do? I've said no. I've gone down that path and succeeded, depending on the policeman, depending on their attitude, right? Because if they're going to just pull out a taser and, you know, just zap you with it, well, it's not worth it. But, you know, if they give you a fine, just give me the fine, get the hell out of here, mate. Just, yeah. I'm nice to them, <laughs> usually. Sometimes I'm, I'm not, but... Um, I just say, just do what you have to do, because I'll deal with the paperwork anyway by writing the, the, the necessary letters, telling, writing them and telling them that I don't need their services, thank you very much, and do not I've contact them. I've started by refusing it. Don't even look at them. Just, you know, you can return to sender. Return to sender. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a joke. It's a joke. The, the, the expression that uh, Dean Clifford teaches, by whose authority 
do you use that name as personal identification? When you go to court, they're bringing you in, they're summonsing your name, your corporation. So they are making, that's very, very, very presumptuous of them because they're assuming that you don't know that you are the sole beneficiary and shareholder of your trust. So unless you rebut that, they're going to send you to prison, they're going to fine you, they're going to do whatever, you, whatever they want. So you need to let them know soon enough. I'm here by special appearance uh, and to uh, have the case dismissed against my corporate name. Uh, who's, who in this courtroom is um, in breach of trust? I've also had the idea of <coughs> summoning them to my place for a hearing. Yeah, why not? <laughs> do what you feel, man. Come? Yeah, you come to my place. We can talk there. You come to my place, man. We'll talk there. Um, look, there's a lot of information that I can go into here. Okay? There's a lot. But I really think you'd be served better by listening to Dean Clifford. Please do it. Do you remember that... Um, uh, those trusts that I put up, those trusts apply around the world, man, through the UN, through the Rothschilds uh, Geneva Convention and all of those conventions that, you know, make us free. Um, they're all Sestwi KV trusts. Sestwi KV trust, those, those were three trusts. You see, look, this is how it works. There's, there's the Pope, Pope Boniface, that's his tombstone. And he was the one that first wore the, the double crown and then the triple papal crown came along. And that is the tiara or the trirenium, the three kingdoms, the three trusts. Steal your property, steal your, uh, your um, real estate, steal your personal property, steal your souls. They are the harvesters of souls. Because how it works, it, it works on the sacrament of penance and indulgences. You're a sinner. You're a sinner born a sinner, but you've got some credits with this gracious God in the heavens. And we are here as God's agents. None of you going straight to God and having a relationship with your spiritual father yourself. No, they've inserted themselves in the place of God, right? And so they're going to administer your sins, man. They're going to bring you in for a hearing. Excuse me, father, for I have sinned. And we go. What's the deal with, with the Mormons when every person who dies on the planet I've seen, they get the name and they do some special ritual? Yeah. What's that about? You can rest assured that it's shonky. Yeah. I don't know what it's all about. Why do they have everybody's name under those vaults, yeah. under those mountains in Utah? They've got no right. They're presumptuous. They're all presumptuous. Yeah. They're presumptuous. The monarchies are presumptuous because they've got blue blood. Well, if you want to find the best blood on the planet, prick yourself on the thumb with a needle and look at that blood because that's the best blood that there is. It's in your body. Yeah, it's not in, 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 in Prince William poncing around you know, and all these fools that go and adore him. Oh, Prince Elwood, Prince Elwood. Well, <laughs> Do they know, if I could tell those poor blind people how many people that he stands for that he's murdered. He's murdered. They are the murderous most murderous family, together with the Rothschilds, in history. Their business is murder since Hudson Bay and, and East India Company, when they were pirating the seas. They're pirates. They are filthy, rotten, dirty, criminal pirates that torture us when we start to think. See, the inquisitional officers, they haven't gone away. And they tell you, they tell you, there's a sheriff in New South Wales. I tell you that they're serving the cross, the Christ, the Antichrist. Catholicism and all its prostitute little whore Protestant uh, organisations that are incorporated, that sit under the, the skirts of the uh, blood-stained mother whore Babylon the Great, which is the Catholic Church, they all are corporations that, that pay massive amounts of royalty to the mother whore in the Vatican. And... Uh, they come to you, these officers of the Inquisition, to summons you to their hearings. I've shown these pictures before. That's the army of the Vatican in the 1500s, 200 ships 
that was uh, painted by Giorgio Vasari in Naples, the Bay of Naples. What's the Pope doing with 200 military ships going on a crusade against the Turks? I wonder if that's just a small portion of how many young men are on manning those boats, man? How much bloodshed is there? How much genetic pool was lost in those days? There's the Pope. There's a photo that you don't want to, you wouldn't want you to see. There's the Pope blessing the army in Italy. Go, brothers, go, shed blood for God. Shed. Shed blood for God. And there's Christopher Columbus. That's a famous painting. You can see many of these paintings. There's the cross. The Dominicans were with him. The Dominicanis means the Lord's. The Dominicans, nice bunch of people. Dominican, Dominus, Lord. Cain, canine, the dogs of the Lord, mate. They'll kill you, they will slit your throat. Just like Julian the Emperor, 40 years after Constantine said, those Christians, they are slit throats. He was saying it back then, man. Porphyry busted them in the third century. Celsus busted them. If you read this, you will know who they are, these people, these literalist Christians. You'll know who they are. He says they're buffoons that go to the marketplaces, stand on their soapboxes and preach the Gospels that they don't understand. And they try and seduce widows and, and orphans. But as soon as an intellectual comes, they're off. They've gone a runner. And I remember that when I was a Jehovah's Witness. When you, start, when you come across an intellectual, you, you sort of excuse yourself for, uh, well, I've got to go now. And, you, because, and then you talk to, you, you, you know, you usually go in twos when you're witnessing, you know. Oh, yes, we've, we've been trained to go looking for the meek and teachable. We're not going to waste our times with these intellectuals. <laughs> yeah. If these people repent and turn around, which is what it's all about. Repentance is when you've, you know, when you've come down and done your time at the hex. <coughs> The, the hex, right? Six, six, six. Six protons, six neutrons, six electrons. We've all, we are all carbon organisms. It's a hex. We've been hexed, okay? When you flat pack a hex, you get the, the cross. That's the cross of matter that we've been hexed with. It's, not, it's no one's fault. And besides, it's been the age of Pisces. So those poor deluded priests haven't got any much consciousness either to work with. We're all lost in loss of consciousness, but it's coming back. And the thing is, there's only a, a short window of time left before that people really <coughs> need to get it right before these big changes come and we benefit from them. Because if we don't, we miss the boat for another, possibly, I don't know, 24,000 years, another cycle of necessity. And we can, uh, you know, stop the hemorrhaging and save some people and, into the, the, the awakening that's, that's happening. Anyway, these are the people who uh, run the show, the, temp the Temple Bar. That's their holiest of holy temple. It sits on land which has no title. They own it outright. It's the only piece of land on this planet that the Catholic doesn't claim as its own. So they run amok. They are the private guilds that are administering, administering the justice, so-called justice, in our courts. The Church of Saturn, the priests of Baal. In the square mile of London, this is the place where all sorts of crimes are thought up and administered to the uh, proletariat sleeping plebeian masses. According to them, is that the, city of London? the city of London, together with the, uh, the Vatican and the city or the state of Washington, D.C., the three cities run the show. This needs to be checked out. It's amazing. And this one. The money masters. This is powerful and it shows you how money is doing this. That's their system. That's how they run it, the pyramid. Climb that ladder, like John Lennon said in Working Class Hero. There's plenty of room at the top, still, as long as you learn how to smile when you kill. Come to the top, man. You can be the CEO. Just leave your kids at home. You know, wake up six o'clock when that alarm, when that Roman calendar alarm bell rings at six o'clock, and you go and you've got a job. Job equals slavery. That's what it equals. All we need is to eat in here. That's all we need to be happy on this planet. A few clothes, some shelter. That's all you need. We don't need the new laptops. We don't need the new car. We don't need all those 
gizmos and things that they're making for us and enslaving us. These people certainly can't get it. And uh, you just kind of wonder whether these people have been introduced to these people yet. It seems that they uh, haven't because these people are still looking for food and these people have got plenty of food. So yes, it's negative, but it's a fact of life. Anyway, look, so let's get some uh, really balance it now with some good things because I'm sure that most of the presentation was dealing on, on uh, positive things and how we can uh, overcome this situation, okay? We need to reclaim dominion by taking control of that trust. The trust is there and we can do that in a very, very simple way, writing to the Attorney General and telling them that, that you've arrived on the scene and you no longer need their services to administer that trust. It's breach of trust for them to do it anyway. They're getting away with it because we don't know about it. It hurts when you, when you understand what's going on in this world. It needs to be fixed. We want a better world. We all want love and peace and justice and all those beautiful things we can go and visit each other and play our musical instruments and drink tea and love life and all the beautiful different people, black and white and tall and skinny and everything. We're all here, you know, and we have to be divided by these. Look, um, the historicity of Christ Jesus, it needs to be addressed because, again, the presumptions, it looks like he existed. There's a calendar based on him, supposedly, um, which I will dis dis dismantle with a few quotes from this book. George Robert Stowe Mead, talking about the uh, Gnostic Christians, the true Christians, because Christianity is, is the universal religion, you see. All the stars, they do a crisscross. And that is ki ro. They all do this from solstice to solstice. And that's the equinox. That's all it is. That's Christ. Christo, crisscross, crisscross. The sun crisscrosses. Therefore, Christianity is our natural religion. It's been hijacked and counterfeited and shoved down our throats as a fiction. And we believe that it's a real religion because, oh, the beautiful, beautiful words of Christ Jesus in red in the King James Version. I mean, do unto others as you, have, do, as you want people to do to you. Love God, love your neighbour. You know, um, don't be belligerent. Uh, it's just, it's words of wisdom, but it's words not from a historical person. They are words of the Logos. You see, there's the Logos, the Ethos, the Mythos, the Pathos. The Logos is the Word of God, the Word of the mind. The mind of God is 12-fold. See, 12 and 7 are the perennial numbers that you'll see in the Holy Scriptures. 7 is matter, physical matter. 7 chakras, 7 colours of the rainbow, 7 everything else. 12 is mental. The universe is mind. The mind thinks and sets forth in motion what we call matter. Sevenfold matter. That's the soul of Mother Nature. So you've got Mother Nature and Father. They're there. You see? These, these are male and these are female. They're the four rivers that come out of the Garden of Eden. The waters above and the waters below. When you get hydrogen, these, these fellows here are made up of hydrogen mostly, are they not? It's flammable, is it? Isn't it? And then what's air mostly? Oxygen. I know, I've got, I've, I know I've got nitrogen here and I've got hydrogen down here, but, but this still applies. Because these are the waters above and these are the waters below in the Bible, in Genesis. When you get hydrogen and oxygen, H2O, two of hydrogen and one of oxygen, you get water, which is the waters below. And this is, this is a compound and this is a molecule. It's more condensed water. That's all it is. Water, 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 water. The water's above and the water's below. And these are masculine and they burn. When they combine, they flip polarity, become negative, and they're water. And out of water springs forth generation. This is the generative world down here. The atom and the molecule. You can study these fours forever. There's four in everything. Four, 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 four. In fact, I went to the internet the other day and I thought, I'll, 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 look, I'll read about the fours. 
and I'll find an article so that when I do my presentation, I can show people that the fours are everywhere, everything. It's that great number of solidity. And I just pulled up the first page that was on Google and uh, I'll read it to you. One of the building blocks of Jewish time, space and soul is fourness. Oh yeah, they love that number. And they say that seven is the, the most wonderful thing that God created, mind over matter, the twelve over the seven. And I said, there's nothing more great in the eyes of God than the number seven. There are four letters of God's name, yod He vah -Heh. Jehovah, yod He vah -Heh. There are four letters of God's name, four matriarchs, four promises of liberation, four cups at the Passover, cedar, four prayers, prayer times that span the Sabbath, four mystical worlds of being, four guardian angels, and according to some, four layers of the spirit. On a more mis physical level, there are four elements, four winds, four seasons, four phases of the moon, four directions. There are four corners of the ritual garment called talit, four species of plants gathered together for the ritual bundle called the yulav, the four poles to hold up the Jewish wedding canopy known as the chuppa. I think, I hope I said that right. There are four ways of interpreting Torah, Peshat, Drash, Remez and Sod. I've explained this in one of my other videos that the Bible is, has four layers. And they're saying here, paradise, the word paradise. Paradise, you've got uh, the top level. The bottom level is um, Pshat, uh, Drash, where you get the Midrash of the Jews, Midrash, uh, Remez, and sod, that's the literal version that you teach 12 year olds. That's the one that you say, oh, Jesus was man. Because you're teaching them like you put training wheels on a bike so that they grasp the stories. You know, you talk about Humpty Dumpty, give them the moral of the story. Little Red Riding Hood, give them the moral of the story. Children learn in this way. They see the beautiful images and the symbolisms clearly. But when you get, you know, like past 12, you're supposed to sort of introduce the allegory and explain to them, well, Jesus, that man that we said was, you know, man, a good man, well, it's, it's, it's the son of God, the S-U-N, it's the son of God. Anyway, and this is the mystical, spiritual mystical, okay, allegory. Uh, there are four, the plain meaning, oh, so, well, it says it here, hang on, uh, uh, so pshat, drash, remez, and sod, the plain meaning, the allegorical meaning, the interpretive meaning, and the mystical meaning. This is the one they give to 40-year-olds, no one under 40 years of age, because it sends them loopy. That's what they say, the Jews. And that's, that's, that's the Zohar and the Sefer Yetzirah and Kabbalah. There are four rivers in the Garden of Eden. Fourness reflects the ages of human experience, youth, maturity gener and generativity, reaching one's full power in midlife and the challenges and joys of old age. The Jewish world tree, the Yetz Chaim, or tree of life, passes through four levels of ex existence on its way between heaven and earth. Each of these fours divide the world into multiple aspects. The elements are earth, water, air, and fire. The worlds are As Asaya, Yetzirah, Beriah, and Atzilut. Doing, feeling, thinking, and existing. It goes on and on. Should I read more? I mean, it's beautiful, but uh, I'm laboring the point really now. There's four, four limbs, four blood types, four Hippocratic humours. So, you know, it goes on and on and on and on. And it's up to us to see the sacredness of these numbers. They're sacred. One is sacred. One is the whole, the universe. It's all one. The cause is one. It's just, it's one, but it's twelve. Because you see, ether is twelve. So the one is 12, because this is how the electromagnetic pulse works. It works, it works in, Walter Russell explains that there are four polarities, not two. And those two uh, yet undefined polarities is what's getting scientists all confused, because they only see the two, electric and magnetic. They don't realise that there are four polarities. 
See, he talks about the pulling this way of the wave. You know, the stretching out of the waves and the length, and then there's the, another pull that tries to give it amplitude. So the one, which is 12, now you're not confused, right? Because that makes sense. The mind is a dodec, is a, the universe is mind. And as it works upon the, the, the motion of the atoms, it creates material forms. It becomes two. The good and the evil. Okay. Now I've I've done this many many times in my presentations. When you um. When you do the Earth and then you do that and then you do the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn and you put the sine wave in there. Oh well, it should sort of do that really. Um, well, this is good, right? Good. You take one zero out. You got God, and you can live here. The opposite of live is evil, and that's down here, where the devil is. Same word. You see, the science, the religion that we've been indoctrinated with is really just science. Knowledge and wisdom. And nature unfolds herself and teaches us once we find the key. This is the key. That's why they go after it so badly. They want you to believe from the church's perspective that astrology is from the devil and the uh, intellectuals and the sophists will tell you that it's a pseudoscience. I, I, I love it when people, and they're quite smart, pe the people who say this to me, you know, it's, oh yeah, oh, astrology, it's a pseudoscience. Santos, it's a pseudoscience. And I'm like, uh, should I or shouldn't I? You know, do I need to just walk away from bothering to explain it or try and help this person? So I've got to make the decision on the split moment. but. If, if only, you know how you feel sometimes that you feel like if only you could just download this person who's not getting it with what you know and you could help them, but you can't because they don't want to listen. They don't, they're, they're out of there. There must be a simpler way though to make them understand. I mean, the ones that are really closed. Are yeah. A simple form. Yeah, there must be. Yeah. You sow seeds, so they Yeah, that's it. That's what I, yeah. So you sow the seeds, yeah. the soil is ready. Exactly. Yeah, there's the four different types of soil. There's another four. Remember the, the parable of the sower? There's the rocky soil, there's the barren soil, there's the good soil, and then there's the other soil. I forget what it was, right? Yeah? So this is the soil. Some will, will reap the harvest and uh, some will produce a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. There's no use judging, there's no use saying, oh, look at me, I'm enlightened and oh, I can think all these wonderful things and everything like that. There's no use doing that because you've still got miles to go, and no matter how, you know. We do know everything, we're just remembering it. Plato said that we are experiencing the anamnesis, the remembering. We are remembering the members that are lost. You know, and, and doing this, coming here and learning this today, is going to help you remember a lot of stuff. Real quick. We're not evolving actually. Going Exponentially. Back to where, yeah. Well, we devolve and evolve. Yeah, we're not evolving because we are going back to where mm. we're supposed to be. That's right. But devolution is right in the mix. Check out Michael Cremo's work. Okay? Devolution. It's. Um, so. The, the, beauty, the beauty of wisdom is here. It's, it's, it's here where you can find this. Remember that the man or the woman, the, the human, because woman comes from man, doesn't it? Well, man, man, and it's man. We're men. It, it's a race of men. In fact, Adama, the Adamic race, remember ascendant, descendant, and um, meridian. That's Adam. That's the... the that other, that other A is in there, but you don't need to repeat it. But dam is red, or blood. And that's Edom. There's other names there in the Bible. Edom, Dom. We are the Adama. In Genesis it says, And man made, and God made man, and called him, called them, not him, them, Adama. It's a race. And it's a race of red blood. You see, we are going through the Red Sea, that's our blood. And Alvin Boyd Kuhn, um, the guy who I, I showed before, this guy has a, a small pamphlet called 
your blood is the Red Sea. And he shows there that in the, the laboratory, your red blood is the same as ocean water. There's no difference, chemically. So we are going through the Red Sea. Here we are trudging along, and we have Aries at the head and Pisces at the feet, as the wisdom shows. And my, you study this wheel, and you will see that all the characters turn up at the right place. The Pleiades is six degrees Taurus, sitting right there. That's the jewel of the sky, the seven sisters. Well, I mean, the head, this is not in proportion, by the way. I mean, the torso comes down to Scorpio. The, the thighs, the thighs should be beginning here, okay? That's where the thighs should start there, okay? So this is not absolutely correct, but if the pineal gland is in Taurus, six degrees of Taurus, it's pretty much right there, isn't it? Would that be the pineal gland, I wonder? Because the theologians will tell you that, oh, the Alcyone, the brightest star of the Pleiades, is where God rules the universe. It's the throne of God. Charles Taze Russell, the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, says that. A lot of them said that because it is. It's the pineal gland. That rules the whole endocrine system. That's the ruler. That's God. That's heaven. And climbing the 33, 33 parts of, of the spine... So do entheogens help us unlock that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's why they will tell you from the church, oh, you don't take mind-altering drugs. Yeah. Well, what, did they, what was the Eucharist originally? The Eucharist that they gave you was the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Hello, you have an out-of-body experience and then you look at your body and you go, aha, I'm not my body. And then you wake up to the fact that you're spiritual and then you live a spiritual life. And how many doctors, great doctors, have used LSD to cure depression, suicidal tendencies, um, with one dose? One dose. Check out the uh, Pharmacratic Inquisition website of Jan Irvin in California, where, he, where he's got all these doctors that have, he's interviewed. Doctors, great men who have cured people. They don't have to take all these, I don't even know what they're called, these antidepressants and things that they give you. Right? One dose of LSD and they're cured forever, gone. Because what does it do? Well, it takes you back in your past and it shows you. It shows you all the things that you've done to, to damage yourself and other people have done and everything like that. And you just shed them. Because if you see them, you shed them. DMT is naturally produced by your pineal gland, dimethyltryptamine. Now, um, a lot of people won't admit to it. You know, uh, Francis Crick discovered uh, the DNA on LSD. Um, you'll find that there's a few other types in there. I'm sure Einstein took something. I'm sure they all did. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci and uh, Michelangelo attribute their wisdom to the rue plant. A lot of the best deconstructionist writings in philosophy, I'm pretty sure, are influenced by They LSD. all did. They all did. Forget Timothy Leary and, uh, and, uh, and these guys that were promoting it in the, in the 60s. Um, th th it's been going on for thousands of years. That's why the animals, the deer, will just jump. They'll kill you for an Amanita muscaria mushroom because, man, they want to try what you're seeing. They want that consciousness because there are levels of consciousness. And some animals are, are locked into the lower levels, you know, the animals without a liver. Then, then you've got, you know, smarter ones like cats and dogs and horses and domesticated animals there partaking of a higher consciousness until they reach the human consciousness which is the Christ consciousness that's what it means when the Bible says and the Christ came in the flesh there's the flesh and you're all conversing and able to understand that's Christ that two-way consciousness which animals don't have animals don't sit there and go oh I shouldn't have done that to my master before that I barked at, barked at him and everything like that. I'll try and be a little bit more humble next time and I'll try and sort of get out of his way. They've got none of that reflective consciousness, have they? We have. That's the Christ, Christ consciousness. That's what it is. And now, with this new wave that's coming, oh, a lot more is going to be restored. A lot more of our psychic powers. So that when you walk around, people will feel your psychic powers. They'll just go, whoa, whew, that person's powerful. You walk into port court, I guarantee you the day will come if, if we have to get there where you just look at the judge and he'll know, whoa, 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 case dismissed. I don't want to touch this guy because he'll know that you know who you are. That's how much power we've got, guys.
It's coming back. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says, If thy eye be single, thy whole body will be full of love. So wow. In a nutshell. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, I always like to go back to this because this is the big myth buster. The big fiction buster, I should say. Um, wow. There's so much to be said here, guys. Oh, God. You look at... Um, you look at the nature of people. Now, um, I've bought one of the best astrological books that you, can, that you can find. Excuse me for one minute. I've showed you this. If you've been to one of my presentations or seen my videos, this book and how he's got snippets of uh, people and the various signs and shows the features. The features are there. Unmistakable. Unmistakable. Um, you know, you can look at your Capricorns and you can see the features. I guess people, just by their features. I guess, I guess the, the sign... Sometimes I go by the fire. I can see the fire. And so I say, I've got to work out whether this is a Sagittarius, a Leo, or an Aries. Then I look at the, see, that's the three, the, the, the uh, triplicity of fire, Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius, for instance. These guys are cardinals, so you can see cardinality. I'm cardinal. <laughs> I ran. I'm a ram. I, I just, I never walk, my mum says. You, say, you always run. Well, Know the planets. Mercury is always near the sun, is it not? So my sun is in my head. I'm Aaron. I was born on the 24th of March, so the sun is in the head. Definitely, it's here. So Mercury is nearby. Where is Mercury in my birth chart? It's in the feet. It's right here in Pisces. Mercury is here. Mercury can only be, can only be there. It can, it can be either in Taurus or in my feet. In my throat or in my feet. It's in my feet. That's what gives me that fast the fast, the speed that I've got in my feet. Always running, never walking. I've seen that in many areas. I notice, I say, you're Aaron. Okay, I'm trying to guess where the mercury is. Is it in the throat? Are they speaking fast? Because if it's here, they'll be... Or if it's here, they'll be thinking really, really quick. Got real... If you're an Aaron and you've got mercury in the head, which most Aaron's will have, whew, great, great. They've got intellect and fire and intuition. So... Another way of guessing people is via the mutability. You can see mutable signs, the Geminis and the Virgos, you can just see it. They don't have this fixability, you know, like this, these fixed signs, they're just, they're so solid and, and fixed. They really are. These guys are directional, you know, your cardinal signs, they are directional. These guys, they say, go straight. These guys go up in direction. These go, the guys go sideways and these guys go, well, you know, diagonally, all sorts of ways, but that's how it's been explained. Um, and it all fits with the sine wave. You see, the sine wave is, is a little baby here, and the angle of the sun's light at sunrise is very, very sharp. So these people get sharp rays of vibration penetrating them on the moment they're born. So if you're born in, you know, like March the 39th, you're going to be receiving a very, very sharp angle of radia radiation from the sun. These guys get a real, real soft one, these Venetian-type Venetian -type Taurians, fixed earth. And their concern is material things, because that's where the mouth is. So they're not, in the, they're not like in the, you know, the fiery intellectual part. They're now concerned with the mouth and material things. It's a material sign. These guys, mutable air, well, that the mutable air, well, fire in the mind, food in the mouth, earth, fixed food, molecules, mutable air, Gemini's the lungs, the two lungs. <sighs> That's where air gets mutated, you know, becomes mutable, doesn't it? It turns into, it goes into the bloodstream and everything like that. Cancer is the water. That's the breast of the mother. That's the mother. In, and, and in the houses of astrological houses, you'll find that this sign has to do with you, the first sign, and it corresponds with Aries. Then your money house, the second house, because it's financial, it's dealing with money. Then you've got your brothers and short trips, because your brothers, the twins, rules the arms and the lungs. And then you've got um, cardinal, it has to do with family, because the crab is like the mother. She collects things and brings them to herself, and it's the family, it's the house. Right? Etc. Etc. 
This is how you can understand all things. It's all here. It's all here. Once you know what cardinal fire means as opposed to mutable fire. In nature, bang, cardinal, birth, growth, decay. So the fire, the fire part of the year, of course, begins here with spring or sunrise and then it fixates over here. That's two to four in the afternoon, the hottest time of the day in fixed fire and the hottest time of the year in Leo, August, July, August. It's all on cue and then bang, it stops here with mutable fire. There's no more fire in this kingdom, in this quadrant. This is the killer of the sun. You see, when the, Jesus dies, it takes three days to be resurrected. This is the resurrection. Easter is the resurrection of the Christ in the sign of the Lamb. These are three days where there's no fire for Jesus. The sun suffers in those months in, in January and February. It's cold. It's trying to grow. It's trying to grow and bring us back to the ph photosynthesis. But right on cue, everything is there. The spring months. The blossom, pull your, pull your bull out and plough because then you can harvest. Twins, generation, lambs, goats, cancer, sun reaches the peak, must come down, go sideways. Leo, the roar of the lion is the summer. The dog days start here, the dog days when Sirius is behind the sun because Sirius is over here, she rules. Our binary star dwells right here in the middle of Gemini and Cancer. And then when it's in the sun around Leo, the dog days begin because Sirius is the dog, Canis Major. So that's why they call them the dog days, the heat of the dog days, because the dog is behind the sun. And as the ancients said, it gives power and thrust to the sun. Anyway, I've been through that so many, many times. So, But um, what I want to do now, just uh, and, and finish off, is um, really, really address the, um, the underpinning, the most in important and vital and crucial part of underpinning this whole fiction, and that is the historical Jesus lie. It's a lie. And um, um, this is just one book I, I, I've chosen to, to, to read from here in exposing Josephus, Tacitus, Oh, Tacitus talks about Jesus, Suetonius, and Pliny the Younger. Okay, just quickly, I, I only need five minutes to just absolutely shred the, this to bits in terms of validity, in terms of proving that Jesus lived, if you're going to quote such nonsense. Few Christians now place any reliance upon the evidence from Josephus. The early fathers made this Jew admit that Jesus was the Son of God. Of course, the admission was a forgery. De Quincey states, the passage is known to be a forgery by all men, not lunatics. Of one other supposed reference in Josephus, Canon Farrar says, this passage was early tampered with by the Christians. The same writer says of the third passage, respecting the third passage of Josephus, the only question is whether it be partly or entirely spurious. Lardner, the great English theologian, was the first man to prove that Josephus was a poor witness of Christ. And you'd have to think, really. Origin and all the first three centuries, there was not one apologist who was defending Christianity that quoted Josephus and they could have, Origin could have said, ah, Josephus mentions Jesus because he didn't. They put it in after. Eusebius and his buddies did that. The Jesuits have been counterfeiting history for hundreds of years, man. It's, it's all wrong. Um, Tacitus, Tacitus talks about Jesus, certainly. This is the big one. Tacitus is the big one. Well, his histories, that's his true work. Uh, but his annals, that's a forgery. And that's where he mentions Jesus. He doesn't mention Jesus here. Actually, he doesn't mention Jesus. He's, he mentions Crestus, who's not Jesus. And it's not saying that he did anything to prove that he did something. There's nothing. There's nothing there that says Jesus did anything. There's just mentions of Christians and mentions and just little brief. In fact, Suetonius, this is what Suetonius, they use this, mind you, right? This is supposed to be proof that Jesus lived. They always, they should stop, at least, they should stop quoting Suetonius. 
because there's only three words. This is the sentence. Because the Jews of Rome caused continuous disturbances at the instigation of Crestus. You're going to go to court with that one? Jesus existed, look at that! It ain't going to work. Not in a real court. The quotation from Tacitus is an important one. The part of the passage which concerns us is something like this. They have their denomination from Crestus, put to death by a criminal, as a criminal by Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius. I wish to say in the first place that this passage is not in the history of Tacitus, known to the ancients, but in his annals, which is not quoted by an ancient writer. The annals of Tacitus were not known to be in existence until the year 1468. An English writer, Mr. Ross, has undertaken in an interesting volume to show that the annals were forged by an Italian, Bracciolini. I've got to leave it at that because I've got to tie, tidy up with what I promised I would, um, and that is... Now... Please, there's, um, there's Dupuy, 200 years ago, exposed the solar, the solar story. Joseph Willis, forgery in Christianity. J.M. Robertson, pagan Christs. This one's the best. I wrote to this guy, and uh, he lives in somewhere in the UK. The pagan Christ, this one is the best. You read this, poetically dismantles the whole story like I've tried to achieve to do. Jordan Maxwell helped in this one. The church, the book your church doesn't want you to read. This is brilliant. The Dark Side of Christian History by Helen Elebre. Brilliant book. Jordan, uh, Michael Tassarian. Astrotheology. D.M. Murdoch. Christ in Egypt. Yes, Christ was in Egypt. I've proven it. <laughs> oh yeah. This one, Cursey Grave, Graves, remember, in the 1850s? This guy has actually revealed that the Flavians, Pisos, the Piso family, the most powerful family in history, is behind the whole lot of it. They made themselves Christ. They did. Vespasian did it. The father of Titus. He was the one that Tacitus says went around performing miracles and calling himself a god. And these guys are excellent too. Timothy Freak and Peter Gandhi. And they've got a series of books. Exquisite. Exquisite. Showing the, the, the truth behind all these gospels and, and, and myths and legends. Now, um, do we remember that image I showed you of Augustus with the crown of thorns? And... and uh, Churchgoers will say, oh, look, we live in the year 2011. That's from when Jesus was on the earth. Well, <clears throat> this, these are some, some, some writings that have been discovered about the, uh, the calendar, the calendar that started around about that time with Augustus. The providence which rules over all has filled this man. Now, a churchgoer will think, oh, that's got to be talking about Jesus but it's Augustus, with such gifts for the salvation of the world as designate him as saviour for us and for the coming generations. Of wars he will make an end and establish all things worthily. That is talking about Caesar Augustus, the man with the crown of thorns, the original, the one and only, and his uncle, adoptive uncle, Julius Caesar. Julius means the son, Caesar means Christ. Caesar, Tsar, Caesar, Christ. And that's what all they, the pharaohs were Christ. They were all Christ. Horace was Christ. It's the everlasting story. By his appearing are the hopes of our forefathers fulfilled. Not only has he surpassed the good deeds of earlier time, but it is impossible that one greater than he can ever appear. Here's another one. The birthday of God has brought into the world glad tidings that are bound upon him. These are what you call, um, what are they, epi epithets? Is that what they call them when they write these glorious 
pontificating uh, um, praises and eulogies to fame. Epitaph. Thank you. I knew I was in epitaphs. That's, that's what they are, man. And, and what we've done is we've, the, 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 the forgerers of history have gone and sort of plucked these things and attributed them to a certain saviour that they, they need for subject, subjugating and, blind, and blinding the masses. This day has given the earth an entirely new aspect. The world would have gone to destruction had there not streamed forth from him who is now born a common blessing. <coughs> this is Augustus we're talking about, same person, but easily attributed to the historical Jesus because it's the same, what's the word again? What, what was that word? <laughs> yeah. Epitaph. Epitaph, yeah. Uh, rightly does he judge who recognises in this birthday the beginning of life and of all the power all the eye powers of life. Now is the time ended when men pitied themselves for being born. He must have been a great man. Alexander Del Mar wrote about it, how they worship that man. He's a murderer. Oh yeah, he brought peace to the world. 40 year peace, Pax Domini, but with murder. And the iron rod man, the Romans were fierce. I can go on. You can get the book that dismantles the whole story. We need to reclaim this false history and we need to reclaim such beautiful books as this, as, 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 as the Bible, and show how this is our best, the best of the best, the cream of the crop, but we need to understand it. Like Shakespeare, he used historical personages, but he was writing plays. He was not teaching history. This is the same. And as I said before, the dominant the dominant ruling power of the time will always pluck those mythologies from the skies and pull them down and, and attribute them to the, the ruling monarch of the time. The 18th dynasty, pharaonic dynasty, is absolutely probably the first ones to have done that. We've got uh, Amenhotep, Tuthmoses, Hatshepsut, Akhenaten, Tutankhamun and Nefertiti, all in that one dynasty. It's all there. All those people. And uh, um, people like uh, Ahmed Osman have proven that you'll find Moses, Abraham, Sarah, Jesus, David, all in that dynasty. Why? See, you have to understand that whilst th these people are not historical, they are still being pinned onto certain historical personages because that's what you do. Like Plutarch said, if Evermerus was doing it, the Greeks have always done it. Oh no, there's a tomb to Hercules just outside of Athens. He lived. You ask the, you know, the Greeks who don't understand and they'll tell you that Hercules was a man, but the, the, the learned ones will say, oh, Hercules is up in the skies. Thank you very much for listening. Time is up.